Hey, this episode was brought to you by the iBiomed program at McMaster University. Follow Mac iBiomed or stick around for more info. Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of Brainwaves. My name is Debir. And my name is Sarah. And we are your third pair of co-hosts for this lovely podcast. This episode, we are going to be talking to some students who have developed their own projects outside of the classroom. Specifically, we're going to be talking to Liana Genovese and John and Matthew Milkovich. Starting off with Liana, she's a fourth year iBiomed and mechanical student who founded her company Imaginable Solutions in 2019. Liana created her first prototype of her product, Guided Hands, in the first year course 1P10. She's now looking forward to the market release of the product later this year. Guided Hands is a product that's able to help people with limited hand motor function perform activities that they enjoy, such as painting and drawing. Hey Liana. Hi. It's nice to see you. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Of course, anytime. Okay, so I guess the first thing we want to know from you is, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I have a strong passion for helping people, and I loved science and biology in grade 12, and I didn't know if I wanted to go into engineering or not, but when I applied for the iBiomed program, I thought it was an amazing way to really get exposure in the health sciences field and engineering field to really find my passion and make a final decision. And I am so, so happy that I made the decision to enter into the iBiomed program. And I really found my passion during the 1P10 project and essentially how I created my company and my company's product. Other than that, I'm also an iBiomed ambassador. I am a mentor to women in STEM, engineering, and entrepreneurship. Uh, I am also a teaching assistant for the fourth year HESI course in the iBiomed program. And I am also a full-time engineering student while running a full-time company, which is as stressful as it sounds. However, again, I found my passion. This is exactly what I want to do. Seeing the smiles on my customers' face every day when I meet with them really gives me the driving force to continue what I do. So... Let's get right into the questions. So the first one that we have for you, Liana, is can you tell us a bit about your company slash your product uh, for people that don't know it? Absolutely. So my company is called Imaginable Solutions. So we create assistive devices to improve the quality of life for people living with impaired motor function. So our first product is Guided Hands. It's an international award-winning product that enables people living with limited hand function to write, paint, draw, and use a tablet, phone, or computer. So Guided Hands not only enables these individuals to perform these daily activities, but it also improves their quality of life through enabling communication, development, of cognitive skills, improving independence, and allowing the user to finally do what they love. And Guided Hands has been able to help people living with ALS, Huntington's disease, cerebral palsy, dystonia, uh, people recovering from spinal cord injuries and strokes. So Guided Hands is able to help people with limited hand function. We're not really pinpointing the medical condition, but the symptom that all of these medical conditions have in common. We're addressing such a global problem with Guided Hands, and we really want to create a more awareness for Guided Hands and get our product into the hands of many people to really change their lives. Uh, I see what you did there. Hands. Uh, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> wow, no, that, that's that's really that's really great that like you you're focusing on so many different types of people that you found that your invention can help all these people. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like a lot of people in iBiomed get into it because we want to make a difference in the healthcare industry and people. Um, so you ended up choosing mechanical as your specialization, right? Yeah. Was your project a big part in uh, how you decided to choose that specialization? Yeah, absolutely. So I created our first product, Guided Hands, uh, the first prototype of Guided Hands in the 1P13 course in the iBiomed program. And it was my passion project. And it was almost 100% the reason why I decided to specialize in mechanical engineering because I was able to connect with the patient, 
I was able to design something. I was able to cat it on Inventor and I was able to build it with my hands, create a tangible product that was able to really improve the life of someone. And just going through that whole engineering design process, I absolutely loved it. It really was almost like a nirvana or I guess, um, what do you call Interesting it? Interesting word. Um, <laughs> not nirvana Wait, what did you mean it was um, like it was like bliss like it was pure... it's like the yeah right yeah i don't yeah, know yeah. where it is i see i think i i think we get what you mean destiny 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 a um, sign okay yes a sign i guess i'll go with that so when i actually completed the first prototype of guided hands and was able to compare what i modeled on the computer to what was sitting in front of me and then actually have the ability to have the inspiration, the woman living with cerebral palsy, uh, try it out. That was almost the aha moment for me when I knew that mechanical engineering and engineering was the route for me. Yeah, that's good because you said you didn't even know if you wanted to go into engineering, right? So that like solidified. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and now, yeah, yeah. now, Exactly. And now I'm leaning a little bit more towards entrepreneurship. Um, but I think the going the mechanical engineering route and everything that I've gone through has certainly put me on the right path to, to where I'm headed. And, you know, it's already introduced me to a potential job and a potential field that I can see by applying this biomedical mechanical engineering degree. Totally. Um, okay, so you said that you created the first prototype of guided hands during your first year course. So what was your inspiration for that idea? Were there like other ideas that you were considering? Like, why did that one come up? Yeah, great question. So in the 1P13 course, we were introduced to three individuals. One was a woman living with dystonia, which is a rare type of cerebral palsy. Another person had narcolepsy. Uh, and then the third person, I believe that they had uh, diabetes. And they all did presentations in front of us. And we had to listen to their presentation and choose someone to create a product for them to enhance their life in any way. So I was moved by Alyssa's presentation. So Alyssa lives with dystonia. And Alyssa gave a really a really a heartwarming presentation. It was it was about the things that she could do and things that she couldn't do based on her condition. So she mentioned that she experienced the uncontrollable curling of her fingers and that did not allow her to perform everyday activities like cutting, using a writing utensil, typing on the computer, and even doing the buttons on her shirt. And she also mentioned to me, which was actually one of the things that stood out to me the most during her presentation, was that she was a talented painter, but as her condition progressed, she wasn't even able to hold on to a paintbrush anymore. And this was a devastating and emotional loss for her that stripped her away of her passion and creativity. And that really pulled on my heartstrings and I wanted to truly create her something to improve her life and even the lives of other people who have a similar condition to her. So with my team, we created the first prototype of Guided Hands. It was actually called the Painter's Guide and it was strictly for painting. But as we finished the project and once I really realized that it was my passion, I decided to continue the project and uh, iterate it. Yeah, so my team and I, we created the first prototype of Guided Hands inspired by Alyssa to essentially just enable her to finally do what she loves again and give her back her independence and passion. Wow, that that's a really moving story. I think that was definitely like a highlight of being in iBioMed, like seeing those people come in, give their stories and knowing that we could do something to help them has really made it real sort of so you mentioned that you created the first prototype during um the 1p13 course so we're just wondering how did you go from a preliminary prototype to actually a fully functional product yeah that's a great question so in my third year i was looking for a co-op 
and I applied to McMaster Manufacturing Research Institute. So because I specialize in mechanical engineering, this was just a co-op that involved a lot of machinery and 3D printing, um, a great co-op for a person specializing in mechanical engineering. However, there was no biomedical aspect to a job like this. However, I needed money, I needed a co-op just like any other iBiomed student, and I had my interview. And during my interview with the supervisor of MMRI, I said to him that I was a biomedical mechanical engineering student. And as soon as I said that, he said to me, oh, we normally don't hire biomed students because you guys crave that biology aspect. And well, this is a mechanical engineering co-op. And that made me pretty mad when I heard that. I, I was really taken back and the whole rest of the interview was just bad vibes. It did not go well. And at the very end, he said to me, okay, tell me something interesting about yourself. So I did. I told him I solved a biomedical engineering problem using mechanical engineering knowledge and mechanics. And I showed him a video of guided hands working and that blew him away. He looked at it, instantly saw its potential and said, I would love to hire you to half of the day, work on your project to give you the resources, the machinery and the materials to transform your prototype into a finalized device. And the other half of the day, I would like you to work on a dental implant project with this dentist since you have that biomedical background. So by being in the iBiomed program, that was my huge step up against other applicants who maybe just had a mechanical engineering background. I went through the entire engineering process again, starting right from sketches, and I redesigned, manufactured, and invented guided hands. And as soon as I manufactured guided hands, I wanted to see if it worked. So I am born and raised in Hamilton, and I made a list of every single nursing home, retirement home, hospital clinic, and rehab center. And at the time, I didn't own a car. So I took the Whoa. HSR and bus to over 50 places. I met, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I met with over 150 patients and physicians. And at the time, Guided Hands didn't, it was a quite large prototype. And at the time, it, it didn't fit in any other bag but a garbage bag. So here's me carrying this garbage bag on Barton Street, walking down the street, heading to a rehab center and doing the grand reveal, taking off the garbage bag in front of physicians and patients. And they loved it. Although it came out of a garbage bag, they loved it. They saw its potential. I saw the happiness and joy that Guided Hands brought to patients' faces as they wrote, colored, and painted. And it was just such an inspiring moment. I'd like to share with you why I started Imaginable Solutions. So I met a 12-year-old little girl named Isabella at McMaster Children's Hospital. And I brought Guided Hands with me and I brought painting supplies with me. So Isabella, she lives with cerebral palsy and she had limited hand function, just like my previous inspiration, Alyssa. And so I brought painting supplies with me. I showed Isabella how to use the device. And as soon as she began painting, the widest smile spread across her face. She turned to her mom and said, mom, I want one. And then the mom turned to me and asked, well, how much is it? And at that point, the thought of even selling this device had never even crossed my mind. I just wanted to see what I made worked. But honestly, I left the hospital in tears. And in that moment, I found my passion. I knew that this was what I wanted to do, whether it be a side hustle or something that I could do for the rest of my life. And that's I guess how I essentially transformed my 1P13 prototype into a product and then into a wow. company. Those are happy tears, right? I hope. Okay, happy thank tears, goodness. absolutely. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's really cool, totally. Like some people think that biomedical um, might make it harder to find jobs or like, like you're going to something that's so specific, but to be honest, it adds to whatever field you're trying to go into mechanical here now to work on a dental implant so wait so he was hiding some mechanical biomedical projects <laughs> wasn't he <laughs> i guess he was yeah and i think it's really important that people who are in the industry give students a chance especially just people going on co-op that's such a great opportunity for us to really use our imagination and innovate in ways that they have never thought of before so i've I'm really 
impressed by that. It's really a great story. Do you know how many approximately uh, guided hands are actually out um, in patients' homes and things like that? Right. So right now we are in pre-launch. So we are focusing on optimizing the design and ergonomics of guided hands. So I've actually partnered with MedT, which is a club at McMaster. And I have 15 engineering students who are working on the design and guided hands 2.0. So to answer your question, we have sold one device to McMaster Children's Hospital and the other device to Isabella. However, we do have upcoming pilots this January uh, with Ron Joyce Children's Rehab Center, Vancouver Coastal Health. So we're shipping it all across Canada, which is very exciting. We also have a pilot with uh, the Children's Hospital in Ottawa, as well as um, we're looking to we're just finalizing a partnership with Bloor View School. It's the rehabilitation center for children in Toronto. So right now we're just focusing on creating awareness within the occupational therapist and physician community, as well as receiving patient feedback and design feedback so that we could truly make the best version for our patients. And we are hoping to fully launched guided hands by May of 2021. I have realized just by going through this entire entrepreneurship process and, you know, learning business from scratch, I don't have a business background. So I've truly had to learn a lot of business along the way. And so there's, there's many things that you have to learn and there's many things you have to consider when you're commercializing a product. For instance, I just realized yesterday that I'm going to have to have the fine print and instructions and the labels, caution labels and stuff that I have to add with all of my products. Just today, I was looking for packaging boxes, um, stickers that I can put on my box. How can I brand my product? So there's many, many things that sometimes you don't really consider when you're in class. But when you're commercializing a product, you learn so, so much along the way. And it's, it's such an interesting, such an interesting journey that I'm sure that all of the iBiomed students will learn in their coursework. What was the progression? Because Sarah and I were talking about this before we actually uh, started the call. We were like, how do you actually get a product and make a whole company? There's got to be so many steps. Could you maybe boil it down? How did you get from your product to a company? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, I didn't have a business background. Quite frankly, I hated business growing up. And yeah, believe it or not. And um, so I didn't have a business background, but I knew that my passion was this project and my goal was to provide guided hands to millions of people. So I had to learn business and I had to fill in my gaps of knowledge. The Forge is an incredible incubator at McMaster. They have supported me every step of the way. So for those who don't know what The Forge is, it is McMaster's business incubator. We have access to it as a McMaster student. They have many resources to help you start a company as a student entrepreneur. When I applied for The Forge, they instantly paired me with a mentor. And this mentor, he helped me through every step of my journey. He taught me business terms. He would sit down with me and go over financials. He was amazing. He connected me with key opinion leaders and physicians that would really help drive my company forward. Great resource. As well, The Forge also offered startup school. So in between taking seven courses at Mac, I found time to take to attend the startup school. So it was every Wednesday for about two, two to three hours. And it was basically a business crash course. Every week they would introduce business topics, for instance, intellectual property, financials, how to find customers, how to do a market analysis. And they taught us all of that. And they taught us keywords during during the startup school. So it really built my business foundation and also built my confidence to really go out and talk with lawyers and talk to entrepreneurs and have that confidence to really, you know, prove to others that I'm not just a young woman who is still a student. I was more than that. I was the CEO of a company. And it was very important that I came across 
and I knew what I was talking about in order to really make them see me as a CEO and not just me as a young student. That's super inspiring and I think a lot of students can relate to just feeling super overwhelmed by school and extracurriculars and I cannot imagine adding running my own company to that list of things so (laughs) it's really impressive and I think a lot of people look up to you for that so thank you yeah I was just wondering have there been has there been a roadblock that has made you question everything and consider just giving it all up or have you just always stayed focused on your end goal throughout the whole process so I can actually tell you an exact moment where I thought exactly that So I had to patent guided hands and I met with a patent lawyer and during our meeting he was using terms that I did not understand. I just kept nodding and I was writing down terms that he used in my notebook and then after the meeting I would google them later. And after meeting (laughs) yeah exactly exactly and so after my meeting I would google these terms and it was very frustrating because I did not have the business background I reached a very low moment it was probably this probably happened during the first two months of uh, starting my company where I had to meet with a lot of lawyers by myself since I was a solo woman founder and I felt like I wasn't the right person to do this. I felt very, very frustrated and sad because I I didn't quite get it. And I was mad at myself that I didn't understand these terms. But instead of, you know, just saying I give up, I persevered and I had to pick myself up and I had to educate myself and that was actually the moment when I reached out to the forge and I signed up for their startup school because I knew that I had gaps of knowledge and to not feel this way and to feel confident I needed to go into these meetings knowing what was being said to me I just I just really acknowledged my gaps and I just went to the best resource that I could to address them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's applicable to so many things that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to not know. Absolutely. And there are resources out there for that specific reason that no person can actually know every single thing on earth (laughs) and it's okay to use resources that are out there because that's why they're out there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the best things to do in that situation, if you are starting a company by yourself or, you know, starting a project is to surround yourself with a strong team, with the strong mentors, strong advisors, people who can really lift you up and support you. It's great to almost be like a sponge to really absorb everything you can absorb all of the information, all of the advice that you can and then really knowing in your heart and in your gut what the best sound business decision is. So you mentioned it a little bit already, but um, what advice do you have for someone who has an idea but doesn't feel confident to move forward with it and take the next steps? Oh, I did not feel confident at all. It is okay not to feel confident. You just have to find your passion and let it drive whatever you do. So for me, my passion was the smiles that I got from Alyssa and Isabella. And I knew that I had the opportunity to change someone's life. And no matter what was going to be put in front of me, a roadblock, someone saying something about my age or my gender, I was not going to let that get in front of me and, you know, derail me from my passion. I would say three main things that I learned was to know your story and be able to tell it. So for instance, when I told the supervisor at MMRI during our interview that I solved a biomedical engineering problem using mechanical engineering, I I had to know my story and I had to be able to share it with him so that he realized what my potential was and what, what guided hands could become. The second thing that I learned was to not let anyone dictate who you are and what you're capable of. You have to define yourself. If you have a passion or an inspiration, you have to drive towards it and let that get you past all of your low moments and really just focus on that. 
I'm actually just gonna, because I have, coincidentally, I know that the viewers can't see this, but I have a Rocky poster behind me. For those who don't know me, Rocky Balboa, his, the movie is one of the most inspiring movies out there. Personally, I think you should all watch this. This is not a paid <laughs> advertisement. Um, but in the movie, he says, one of his famous quotes is, it's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And that's the mantra I live by today. Yes, I am young, I am a woman, and I am a student, but I am the CEO and founder of Imaginable Solutions. And if I can do it, every single one of you can too. You just need to believe in yourself and just reach for the stars. As cheesy as it sounds, that sounded really cheesy. <laughs> I apologize, but it is it is very true. You just need to find your passion and really drive towards well, it. Well, Yana, can you be my life coach? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I am a mentor to a lot of entrepreneurs. Sounds and students. good. I'll, I'll contact you <laughs> later then. <laughs> <laughs> More than happy to. So I guess the final thing we want to know from you is what's next for Imaginable Solutions. So you have guided hands, but do you have any other ideas for products that you want to get on the market? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, we have a team of 15 engineering students already working on Guided Hands 2.0. So this version is going to integrate stabilization into our hand pieces to further dampen the effects of hand jerks and shakiness to further address a larger patient population. So for instance, those living with ALS, Parkinson's disease, or uh, essential tremor. So we have this product uh, being prototyped and researched right now. However, this is just the first product of many to come with Imaginable Solutions. This company, it really helped me find my passion. And when I graduate from the iBioMed program, this is exactly what I want to do. I've been using my company as my co-op every oh, summer. So this is just this. <laughs> essentially, I guess you could say I, I transform my passion into a profession. And this is what I want to do for the rest of my life to create devices and products for individuals to really improve their quality of life and see their growing smiles every day. Well, you heard it here, folks. Uh, that's Liana, young woman, student, entrepreneur, and soon to be my life coach, if I can get that arranged. But yeah, thank you so much for coming out, Liana. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much All for right, having we'll me. We'll see you later then. It. Great talking to you. Bye. Bye. Hmm. This is probably where we'd put a commercial break if we had any sponsors. As of right now, we're just a bunch of students who want to reach out to our professors, our peers, and especially to you, listening in right now. If you want to reach out to us, you can send a voice message at anchor.fm slash McMasterIBiomed or fill out our online form at bit.ly slash brainwaves dash questions. Back to the show. Welcome back from the commercial break. Let's move on to the Milkovich brothers. John and Matthew Milkovich are both iBioMed students who created a DIY respirator design for healthcare workers on the front lines, just like their parents. They made this design in around April of last year from items around the house and 3D printed parts for a total of about $40, and they were able to get their design distributed to hospitals. Hey guys, how you doing? We're doing good, thanks. How are you? All right, so for our listeners at home, can you guys both introduce yourselves? Tell us a bit about yourselves. Uh, okay, I'll start. Uh, I'm the younger brother, uh, Matthew Milkovich. I'm a first-year iBioMed. Yeah, a little bit about myself. I, I really like the outdoors and fishing. I have a French bulldog named Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love oh. it. Yeah, I'm the, I guess we can introduce by by the brother status, but I'm the, the older brother. I'm John, and I'm uh, currently in level three iBioMed, so I'm in the uh, the HESI stream. Yeah, I'm looking forward, I've been looking forward to this podcast. I think you guys are doing a really cool thing. Yeah. Aw, thank you. <laughs> We're very excited to talk to you guys. Um, totally. So I guess we'll just dive right in. So, Devere, take it away. What inspired you guys to come up with the idea? Uh, so... My dad's an anesthesiologist and my mom's a nurse, our, our parents. And uh, a big thing is at the beginning of the pandemic, when we thought there'd be a lot of N95 shortages, we were really worried for our parents' safety. 
So we wanted to find uh, an alternative that was almost as safe as an N95, and that could be used in situations where they're working. So uh, yeah, our main goal was just our parents' safety, and that's kind of where this idea sprouted. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you, can you remind us exactly what it is you made and how you made it? So uh, like I said, my, my dad is an anesthesiologist. So what we did was we found this really interesting mask from two years ago when we were vacationing in Croatia. And it covers all mucous membranes, which is pretty cool. We, we found this mask and we were like, okay, this could, we could do something with this. So uh, instead of using the snorkel, we removed it and we catted and 3D printed a... Uh, so, so it was a snorkel mask? Yes, yeah. Uh, like for I scuba see. diving. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so basically from there, uh, we decided to CAD and 3D print this little T-piece that would replace the snorkel. And we used two anesthesia filters from our dad, and we would attach them on top, and that would be the filtration system. That's really so that would replace, like, the filters that you would find in an N95 mask? So testing showed that, um, you know, these filters were, I mean, anesthesia grade, so it depends on, like, the type of filter that you use. We were using, like, a mix of electrostatic filters and HEPA filters, HEPA filters are sort of the, I guess, the gold standard, but they were pretty hard to get. I mean, they were sort of one of the the resource, uh, I guess, limits during the pandemic because that's what was connected to the ventilators. And so, you know, we, we sort of settled, I guess, for the electrostatic filters, which we found were a little bit easier to respirate through. And they also had pretty high high filtration rates. I think we were looking at like 99.9999 percent Whoa. filtration yeah. so way higher please. than my average <laughs> <laughs> so so that was just a filtration obviously of the the particular filter and its model that we were using now when it comes to our actual mask we didn't really have i guess much to work with in terms of the actual testing and validation itself i mean we were working on uh, our neighbor's garage printer stacked oh, wow. on a on a John Deere tractor with a with a couple of hockey sticks. So we didn't really have uh much in terms of our testing equipment. So we couldn't necessarily guarantee the same effectiveness, filtration and safety as the N95s that were in short supply. And so we had to but you know with the filtration of the actual anesthesia filters, this was more so a backup if cases of COVID within the actual ICUs became too high and N95s became too low. We could offer this as a potential backup for our parents, which ended up escalating quite a bit once we started, I guess, marketing it on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. You guys really just took what materials you had and ran with it. And I think that's exactly what kind of thing people want to see. And it's really innovative. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, totally what iBioMed's all yeah. about. <laughs> so how do you feel like your iBioMed knowledge helped you with the design process? I mean, Matthew, you weren't even in iBio yet at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, So I guess it's more towards, um, towards John, but how do you feel like your iBioMed knowledge and experience with designing of prototypes helped you with creating this design? Uh, so actually, Matthew was the one who, I guess, sort of started the the idea i don't know why you had the oh, the yeah. mask out I, I think it was like i don't even know why i, I, I was the weird the kid at the That's beach who wore, <laughs> the awesome. weird kid that wore that mask because uh, <laughs> i just thought it was so cool that like it covered your entire face yeah, so you yeah, could yeah. see everything and i'm like wow that's yeah. pretty neat uh so i i got it just for fun and then it was in our garage and i'm like wow this like covers all mucous membranes like i, I know that's a first weird, thing you think of. it's a weird thing to just like <laughs> so, totally to think right. of but uh uh, yeah, <laughs> so when you're thinking about it like COVID related, then uh, it, it kind of just clicked. Obviously, I didn't have the catting and experience yet, so that was kind of more my brother. Yeah, so he found the the scuba mask and was like, "Oh, this is like they're talking about face shields. You know, this could be like you know a face shield, right? It has a pretty good like seal around the face." And then uh, you know we had like, oh, "Okay, obviously this is." Uh, not the the usual household item, but we had a couple of anesthesia filters lying around just for my dad. And so we just kind of, I guess, brainstormed how could we, I guess, retrofit this mask so that it could create 
a airtight circuit with these anesthesia filters and and the scuba mask itself. And so we started kind of brainstorming the ideas. We came up with a couple of prototype sketches and then that's where I was able to sort of take the iBiomed cadding expertise and start cadding away. And, and we had a neighbor also helping with the cadding as well because we needed to, I guess, you know, here's a couple of things that I learned and applied for my biomed. The first thing that I learned is defining the problem. Um, I guess that's one of the things that is always stressed, I guess, within the curriculum. So I'm sure you're you're experiencing it now in 1P10, Matthew, but it's so easy to sort of jump to the the solution itself and try to come up with these sexy and glamorous ideas when really, you know, and you kind of lose sight of what you were originally, I guess, designing for. And so we had, you know, defined this problem in our, our mission statement to come up with this backup for N95s because of the, the imminent shortages that were happening. So I guess that was the first thing and I guess the first step in the design process. Uh, the second thing that was great is we we were sort of able to utilize our experience with 3D printing and, and rapid prototyping. And so we want to make sure that the T-piece fit on like perfectly, like, you know, just for this particular model. Sorry, wait, masks. So what's the T-piece exactly for our audience? Oh, uh, the T-piece was that uh, 3D printed adapter between the uh, snorkel mask and the anesthesia filters. So, um, so it's kind it's... of, it has three holes. Two holes are for mm-hmm. the anesthesia filters to attach. And then the one hole is what connects the snorkel mask, which is obviously on your face. So it's kind of like a three. That's why we called it a T-piece because uh, the filters kind of came out like a T. And okay. the bottom of the T is what connected to the snorkel mask. Right. I see. Yeah. And so we were based, I don't know how many we printed with our neighbor. We, we printed a lot just to make sure that the, the fit was like really tight to make sure that there wasn't any, I guess, gaps that could put, you know, the user in, in harm's way. And so that was the one thing that was really great as well is, you know, we were able to go through that rapid prototyping testing part. And then once we had, I guess, the the perfect dimensions, that's when we really took off. And 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 being in Hesse, and I think you're you're interested in Hesse too, right? Yeah, yeah, that's I am. that's a stream. We're so used to, I guess, working on a project and then you know having it get marked and then get you know stored away. This is the, I guess, first experience. Maybe you can elaborate on your experience as on this a little bit more. Taking a project not necessarily from just the rubric, but bringing it to the real world. Yeah, to kind of add on to that, one thing that iBiomed didn't teach me yet, or uh, it kind of is missing out, is like the the marketing aspect. So uh, we were kind of stuck making this iMovie that was maybe not top notch, but um, it ended up getting the point across, which is, and I think our strong suit was definitely in the design and the effectiveness of our mask. Yeah, marketing was definitely not our uh, our best, but uh, I did think that iBiomed, well, I know now, taught us a lot for this project. And can I just wow. say, I love that you're in Hesse and we're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to CAD something. I'm going to use my experience yeah. and take this integrated approach and actually, you know, create something. Because I think a lot of people get stuck in that that category so if they're not in mechanical they think they can't just start catting so i love that you're you're in second year now or third year uh, i i'm in third year yeah so you're in third year and you're you're just like yeah i'm in hesse but i can cad something and i can design something and use those skills and take it and actually create something so i love that i guess the next thing we're kind of wondering is how far has this idea come since its inception so we know that you know you guys have gotten a lot of um, I want to say kind of publicity from the McMaster engineering community, but outside of our community, what have you guys, what's the response been? If I could start, you know, one of the things I guess, and, you know, maybe you haven't experienced this yet, Matthew, but in Hesse, we sort of get, we delve a little bit more into the, the entrepreneurship aspect and, and taking an idea and actually focusing on the scalability part and how to define your your market and to communicate with stakeholders. That's really the the huge part and one of the things that I really lucked out with being in the HESI program when when we were taking this idea to the to the next step. And so um in in terms of now, I guess, you know, like 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 Matthew said, we 
Actually, do you want to just describe the the YouTube video, filming the YouTube video? Uh, yeah, so uh, the video, we did not know what we were doing with that. We, our, our, I watched it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was definitely like uh, the iMovies you would see in like uh, grade six or seven when you're... <laughs> When you when you're doing a little school project and that's that's oh, yeah. all we really knew with computers and all that we're we're not very good with that stuff so uh, it was a good process but like we did make a script and we made sure to have talking points and we tried to add in the actual T piece being printed try to make it a little fancier than <laughs> um, an iMovie but um, that process was a little bit challenging because we're not experts in it but clearly it, it did end up getting the point across which is kind of all that mattered so uh, yeah i was actually happy with the result yeah and so basically we we launched this youtube video we're not really expecting anything from it we we just thought you know and i guess one of the big biggest things is we wanted to and this is something that i guess i biomed taught me personally is you know the the value in an idea we it's as a high school student and an undergrad student, I didn't, we didn't really think that we had uh, much to offer. But here we just had this simple idea, and we wanted to get it across. And really, just our goal was to to help people. And so, we launched this YouTube video, not really expecting anything. But you know, we provided the you know the whole point of it was DIY, do it yourself. And so we included all the materials and and the the STL file. Actually, no, I included my email. And then we provided the STL file and distributed it that way. And the STL file is what again? The STL file is the, I guess, the the blueprint for the 3D printed uh, T piece that Matthew described earlier. From there, we just got, it It sort of blew up and we just got started getting an influx of emails from all over North America from these hospital groups and wow. physicians and nurses and and people we really didn't expect to hear from. And you know, we were just sort of doing this. Uh, I, I mean, I was. Do we were both doing this sort of through the school year, and then that's when we started getting the faculty of iBiomed involved. Yeah, and it was it was kind of one of those things we thought, why not post it? Because it was clearly helping our parents, so maybe it could help like other parents of. Because like I I know we say it's easy stuff around the house, but you kind of got to be an engineer to have some of this stuff. You got to have access to a three D printer. You also need access to a bunch of things that you wouldn't really know unless you had that engineering background. So we wanted to kind of just get this across to other engineers or other people who had access to 3D printers because, for example, we didn't even have access to a 3D printer, but we knew someone that did. In doing that, we printed dozens and dozens of these T-pieces and we distributed them ourselves too. So it was kind of just, um, I know we say it's readily available, but not everyone has a 3D printer. So it was getting the point across so they could reach out to people that did and um, kind of just distribute the product like that. Yeah, right. yeah. Just tell people to raid their neighbors' houses and <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <Pretty exactly. much. laughs> so how far has this idea come since its inception? Like, where has it been like distributed and used? Yeah. So I guess I can, I can cover that. So we we start hearing from from different people all across. North America. And then some people said, Oh, I don't have, you know, a 3D printer. Is there any way I could still, you know, get my hands on the T piece? So we started printing the T piece. Well, I, I, our neighbor did, you know, he was extremely generous and in, in helping us out pretty much around the clock. And it was, it was a pretty lengthy print. I think it was like around eight hours because we wanted to make sure that Whoa. the, the infill it was, was, you know, the like, infill being the infill being like the, the I guess the density of the print we wanted right. it to be um, you know I guess substantial enough so that it couldn't prov to sort of I guess mitigate any sort of potential leakage um, mm. that could occur that but obviously we couldn't guarantee that there would be leakage or not but you know we sort of took I guess efforts to make sure that you know I, although this was a 3d printed, prototype we wanted to to polish it up as much as we could and so we started printing around the clock and i guess i would say that we distributed approximately 100 masks um you know we would just Whoa. i guess hop on our hop on our bikes and we'd have this like bag of bikes. tea pieces and That's boxes crazy. and 
yeah, and then go to the local post office like every day. Yeah, That's awesome. <laughs> and just start. We just start mailing them out. Um, we also ordered a bunch of masks as well, and so anyone who had you know experienced difficulty putting the teepees on to the actual mask itself, we would just so the scuba send mask. that out. The scuba mask, yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. And then we would just charge them the cost of the shipping as well as the supplies, so that you know it was a net zero gain because we didn't really want to I guess profit from this we just wanted to help out yeah that was that was our goal and in terms of now we we the influx of emails has settled a little bit just because there's not as much panic and around you know the first wave of of COVID-19 is Mm -hmm. and uh the the supply of PPE is a little bit more steady but we still get emails and some feedback from doctors who and and nurses who are actually continue to use our masks today which is really neat to hear yeah there's there's a lot of uh doctors still that prefer our mask over an n95 i'm not saying that it's necessarily safer but uh (laughs) they they actually find it more comfortable so yeah that which is Ah, is really cool i'm not i'm not saying it's better than an n95 because i don't think you can get better (laughs) than that but uh it definitely uh some doctors do feel safe with it which is really nice yeah no, we've all seen those photos of healthcare workers taking off their N95s and Ooh. they have the lines on yeah. their faces mm-hmm. and it just looks so painful. So the scuba mask cover your whole face and I feel like that could be more comfortable. But even if it's not currently being used by all doctors and everyone in the healthcare industry, I think it shows people that you can do something from home and actually make a difference to people in the healthcare industry and those workers that are on the front lines. So that's really awesome. So how's all the bike riding and distribution been going since April? Has that also died down? <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely died down. That was more of a, a summer uh, thing. I, I don't know if I'm going to bike in minus 10 anymore. I might, I might just end up driving there. So um, yeah, but uh, we haven't been ordering too many masks because like I said, it was a big scare that we would be low on PPE kind of uh, like okay. six months ago, but it's not as big of a concern now. Uh, yeah, they ramped up the, the 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 production of PPE by a lot once they realized how mm-hmm. in short we were. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was good. To hear. In terms of where it's at now, you know, we we've heard from a couple of people they've they've used it as, or they've at least tested it as a backup. We heard from the government of Nunavut, uh, a public health officer there. So it was actually being, I, th- I believe, printed there as a, as a backup um, to, the, to the N95 shortages, which is really cool to hear right. as well. So we're now still, you know, I guess, responding to feedback. Um, again, we're extremely open to it. And, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we took away is Although we haven't, I guess, pursued it as much as we did at the beginning of the pandemic, we took a lot of really key learning points away. And I'm sure mm-hmm. you did too, actually going into iBiomed and actually learning about how to CAD and how to how to be this, you know, design thinker. Yeah, it was it was like having a design project before the design projects, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Like uh, we, you get design project zero and one, but it was like, yeah, what I, I, you got, minus I one. got minus one, which is really cool. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I actually have a question that I don't even know if you guys are going to be able to answer. This is actually just something that came to mind. So the N95 masks, it's kind of like a one-use thing, right? Yeah. But your mask, obviously you would reuse the scuba part, but what part would you have to replace if you wanted to reuse it? Would it just be the filter that's put in the T-piece or... Yeah, so it's actually just the filters that need to be changed. And I believe it's like you, that you can use the filters more than once, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there's a certain time where the filters are, you know, they're they're not useful anymore. They're not safe. Like just like N95s are, you know, also filters in the same sense and have a certain certain usage time. Uh, I believe it was, I'm actually, I can't remember quite sure, but I think maybe at least a couple of days if you're wearing it like continuously. But in terms of the actual uh, mask itself, you know, it's good to just like, we sort of were just advising and providing some, you know, advice on how to reprocess it. So, you know, we create a dilute bleach solution that was able to act as a disinfectant. There were some, uh, I guess, protocols coming out on how to reprocess face shields. And, and so we were sending those along with all the other stuff 
when we'd send out the STL files to make sure that people were reprocessing it safely as well. So where is this project headed from now on? Uh, to be honest, I, I kind of hope it dies down because that means the pandemic's over. But um, <laughs> true. Yeah, like, I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind if it fizzled out just in that sense. Right now, it's kind of like like we said at the beginning, PPE shortages was way more of a concern than it is now. So um, right now, we do get emails once in a while. But um, really, what we where we see this project going is obvious. Some doctors do still use it, and they like using it. But I'm kind of just hoping it fizzles out just so the pandemic's done and we can go back to normal lives. Totally. Yeah. In terms of like where we want the project to go, I guess one of the things that we learn from this is, you know, maybe not all projects or, you know, initiatives we need to completely pursue. You know, this is something that um, we had come up with and that we had really wanted to, I guess, like, you know, cultivate and create awareness around and, and then once we had actually done that, you know, we, we obviously learned a lot from it. And, and like Matthew said, this is a sort of worst case scenario to, um, to N95s. And so if the N95 supply is stable, you know, obviously everyone is happy and, you know, this is, this is the ideal situation. But in terms of actually, you know, where we want this project to go, we just hope it's, uh, I guess, can serve as an example to show how, you know, it doesn't really matter how how old you are or how much expertise or what kind of degree you have, you know, I think any idea, you know, whether you're, you're in high school or, you know, elementary school to, you know, you're in your, your PhD and your expert, you know, industry field can carry a lot of worth and merit. Totally. And I think that's a great message to send. Just try things out. It doesn't have to be super famous. You don't have to get millions of dollars. Just, you can learn from anything. Wow. All right. Well, that brings us to the end. Thank you guys very much for coming out. And yeah, I guess we'll talk to you later. Yeah, thank Sounds you good. so much for coming out, guys. Thank it's thank your neighbor to. for us. He's yes. Yes. superstar yes. right there. We'll definitely be sending this to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Bob. good. <laughs> shout out to Bob. Shout out to Bob. Yeah, shout out to Bob, of course. <laughs> All right. Peace All right, out, guys. guys. Okay. Thank you so much. Great to talk thank to you. Thank you. Hey. You reached the end of this episode. Well, there's actually a bit more. Thanks for donating your brainwaves to us for this short amount of time. To keep up with what's on our minds, make sure to like and follow the podcast. We'll be releasing new episodes on the first Thursday of each month with a different set of hosts. Got a question, comment, or a suggestion on your minds? You can send a voice message at anchor.fm slash McMasterIBioman or fill out our online form at bit.ly slash brainwaves dash questions. Want to keep up with all things iBioMed? Follow our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channels at Mac iBioMed. And thanks to Lope Music Production for our background music. Until next time. <laughs>